thank you for this another brand new day. God, last night you allowed us to lay down. This morning you allowed us to get up. In between the laying down and the get up, you saw me fit to keep us here. So God, we got so much to be thankful for. And we praise you. We give your name all of the glory. Oh God, thank you for those who are here, those who are listening. We pray something will be said to help you. Thank you for our pastor, our first lady, Bishop Lady Cook. God, hide me behind the cross. Let me share something today. Be impactful to your people. And all God's people say amen. You're glad to be in the house. before you this morning. It's always good to come home. And uh, when you don't have to be introduced, it is always good. Uh, I am grateful. I'm eternally grateful to God for today and this opportunity to our wonderful pastor, Bishop Copeland. Thank you so much. And the preacher of the gospel, it is so good to see each and every one of you. Uh, now, I do have a whole hour. That's a joke. <laughs> it is our church anniversary today, and so uh, I have to do this twice. So I probably, no, I'm going to give all I got right now. You know. <laughs> Something happened between now and then. I'm too. It's so good to see each and every one of you, to Sister Brown, to my sister. There is a word from the Lord this morning, and I pray that you will run with me to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Book of Romans, chapter 5. I want to lift up this morning just two verses in your hearing, verses 10 and 11. Romans chapter 5. Verses 10 and 11. Once you found the text, mind saying, Amen. Amen. The Bible reads, it says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of the Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Verse 11, the B clause simply says these words, but we also rejoice. Just for a moment this morning, if you will, I want to preach about I'm shouting off of substance. Shouting off of substance. As little children at the church that I grew up in as a, an infant, let me be clear, we often jeered and laughed Sunday after Sunday seeing the same individual fall out, get fanned and get back up again like nothing ever happened. To be honest, it began to be comical because we could time it. We knew when it would happen, how it would happen, and yes, most of all, we knew to whom it would happen. Mind you, we were young, we were naive, and mostly unlearned to characterizations of the 19th century ring shout, which we saw glimpses of in the late 20th century, that of which feet taken from the floor and the progression is mainly due to a jerking, hitching motion, which agitates the entire shower, and sooner or later the shower 
burst out in streams of sweat. The usher would fan, and it seemed as though there was something powerful in the fan that had Dr. King's face on it, or the fan that had the nearby funeral home picture upon it, because more and the more they fanned, the more intimate or animated they seemed they become. That was then, and then I began to find out that they weren't just shouting because of habit. But they were shouting because they believed in some substance. They weren't shouting because they had life all figured out, but they were shouting because even when they didn't, God did. They weren't shouting because they believed they were perfect, but they were shouting because even in their imperfections, God would use them to bring him ultimate glory. Then as I got older, I'd be sitting in the midst of worship and some water would accumulate in my eyes and I'd wave my hand even if I couldn't say a word because I wasn't just crying over habit, but I believed in substance. You who gather this morning, I believe that your worship and your dedication and your commitment is not out of habit, but it got to be about substance. Once we get to a point where we stop coming to church out of rope memory and we get to a point where we start thanking God, not because of the things that we have, but because that God sent some substance our way, a church would be abnormal. We would be able to shout and ain't nobody got to prime you or push you. You just remember what it did for you just yesterday. Can easily go to waste for they 
shout over being chosen to be on the prices right, but as soon as they realize that the stage is fleeting, the excitement is gone. Maybe they should know that just because you make it to the stage, it don't mean you automatically got access to the prize. The stuff that we have not only shows us, but we're already blessed with the prize. Tell somebody we got something to shout about. Now I'm bothered when some people only want to hear about the substance only on Good Friday and Resurrection morning, but that substance is good enough to shout about. universe to establish the unstable. He goes on to say that the cross is set up in the cosmos in order to give future to that in which is passing away, give firmness to, to, to that which is unsteady, to give openness to that which is fixed, hope to the hopeless, and in this way to gather all that is, and all that is no more into the new creation. That sounds like a perfect description of the substance of our shouting. This Roman writer employed some language that give Mohammed's words more credence for he writes in the book of Romans as a herald of the gospel sharing it with a party he is yet to meet. Paul, this Roman citizen, blends in content on faith, Old Testament, God's judgment, hope, the cross and the resurrection. But mainly in chapter 5, he places believers on full display in all of their sin and all of their degradation. But in verse number 8, Paul says that, but God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is substance because while we were in it, God was already devising a plan to get us out of it. Don't you know that the mind of God is so vast and incomprehensible that God can see your flaws and be creating a plan to free you at the same time? God is ambidextrous because God can be handling your problem and your problem without allowing the sun and moon to miss their daily appointment in the sky. But I love it because the Bible tells us in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, the Bible says that the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handy work day to day, pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, but their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out all of the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. In other words, he says that the sun and the moon can't talk. The sun and the moon cannot make audible noise but it gives you what you need every single day. And that simply tells us that God has a way of working through that in which we don't expect to send us what we need. And at the same time that God is sending the sun and moon in rotation, he's making sure that your life is not out of rotation. God orchestrates the heavens and the cosmos while maintaining your body. He put 206 bones in your skeleton, 28 bones in your skull, 14 bones in your face, 33 bones in your skeletal system, gave you 12 pairs of ribs and 25 trillion red blood cells in circulation at one time. And if you cannot shout on the substance of God maintaining the sky, you should be able to shout that God didn't let you die. That God didn't allow your body to go out on you last night, but he kept you here for a purpose. 
It was because there was some substance that held you. <laughs> Just to not say that those who went on before us did not have this same substance, but God made you to be the remnant, and since you are the leftover, don't leave your shout out. You might as well get it out this morning. Don't take it all with you. You might as well go ahead and shout it out. Such substance of God's love and cheer is presented in total opposites to what we once were called in verse number two. And don't leave me this morning. The text says that we were enemies. And enemies is not just being on the other side of someone. Enemies are those that got contact, but it's not real fellowship. And I want to let you know, you can be in contact with somebody and still be no fellowship. Because fellowship will look beyond just the contact. It will find itself having love even when we're not around each other. Y'all didn't like that because you, you were really examining who you got around you and you wonder, now are we in contact or are we in fellowship? Howard Thurman once said that fellowship on your own terms, that we uh, that, that it's easy for us to have fellowship on our own terms and to repudiate those terms if they are not acceptable. Sometimes we look at the substance that God has given to us and we fellowship with God, not on God's terms, but on our terms. And whenever our terms trump God's terms, we enter into terror, enemy territory. But the story did not end without any mistake, but instead we can shout because of first God's plan in Christ's pain. All right. God's plan in Christ's pain. That while we have become enemies by way of one man, another man established our feet on solid ground. One man separated us from our heritage and another man gave us substance that exchanged our pain for his pain. It was through the peace offering of God by his son on Calvary that we all are in alignment with God even so much so. The Bible says we shall be saved by his life. This phrase by his life is talking specifically about the resurrected life of Christ who in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Christ lives to speak on behalf of those who are sometimes afraid to speak on his behalf. And when Christ is interceding on our behalf, he is petitioning without needing a signature. He jumps in the middle of the jump rope while also controlling the handles on both sides. Paul, I'm trying to tell you is that by the way of the cross and the grave, there is a plan and some substance that was there before he went to the cross and is still there even now. before you go into the barber shop or the beauty salon, the same great substance that walked into the shop is the same great substance that walked out on the other side. You can fix up the outside, but if your inside is ragged in, it will still be some bad substance. Jesus had all power before the cross and had all power in the resurrection shall be saved by his life. <laughs> but, but secondly, I want to let you know, we got some substance to shout about because of our praise and our predicament. Paul says in verse 11 that not only that, but we also rejoice. We also brag. We also boast and have glory in the fact that it is in God through whom we have now received Reconciliation. Tell somebody that is substance worth shouting about. Our joy is not 
constrained or constricted, but instead it is conveyed by the way of Jesus Christ. In him we have been offered adjustment away from our sins. In him we have been offered restoration from our separation. In him we have been offered a fix for our broken situation. In him we have been offered an opportunity to make some noise and brag about where he has brought us from. I love it because Acts 17, 28 says that it is in him that we live and move and have our being. And since it is in him, I got something worth shouting about. <laughs> Let me tell you that on the cross, this predicament we find ourselves in as enemies was slowly being moved from separation to reconciliation. As Paul says, it is through him. Jesus is the instrument. He's the agent of our shout. But Jesus is the substance of our movement towards the Lord. When they were whipping him, they thought they were moving him further away from life, but rather they were moving us closer to eternal life. They thought that on Calvary, they were pushing him away from his destiny, but instead his body was moving us closer to our destiny. The more they crucified him, the more we became closer. The more they crucified him, the closer we got. The nail in his hand was moving the needle for us. The nail in his hand was moving the needle for us towards reconciliation. Pain after pain was moving us a little closer. Tell somebody the nail moved the needle. This is why we can praise him in the predicament because he is the substance of our shout. Verse 6 of this chapter, Paul said that for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. The New Revised Standard Version says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the undone. Those uh, who were riches undone. Those who were the band of society. Those who were enemies of the Lord. He died for them all. And he took on that in which we could not handle for our sin. Can I tell you that what he did added something to us. He gave us what we need. But I saw something uh, a few days ago that brought me to the cross in that moment. While sitting at the feet of a small
we claim it that day. And Lord, as we get ready to leave this place, we ask of God that you not leave us. Keep us, Lord, from great harm or danger. The enemy is lurking, and he's seeking whom he may devour. But help us, oh God, to stand, stand firm like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Let our roots run deep that we can stand in terrible time. Thank you now. And as we leave, may the grace of God, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, would rest and move with us henceforth and forevermore. The people of God said, Good morning.